Good morning. Uh, I can't believe that the conference is already coming to an end. Well, uh, I hope uh, you gain new insights on digital transformation from many of these wonderful sessions that we had over the last three days. So when we were designing uh, this program for this year, uh, what we really wanted to do was emphasizing this aspect that uh, legacy companies are not just playing the catch-up game, legacy companies are not just playing the defense, but legacy companies have something to offer that the digital native companies do not have. So with that background, uh, I am so delighted that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Ron uh, Fry has agreed to speak uh, on this particular topic at this conference. Um, we save the best for the last. So Ron is Professor of Organization Behavior and co-inventor of Appreciative Inquiry, a very powerful tool for organization change based on its strength and the power of dialogue. Uh, I believe that the combination of Digital First Framework and the Appreciative Inquiry offers a very powerful tool for legacy companies as they per uh, pursue their digital transformation journey. With that, I'd like to ask you to welcome my friend, Ron. Good morning. I am Ron Fry, a professor of organizational behavior at the Weatherhead School of Management here at Case Western Reserve University. It's a real pleasure for me to be with you this morning in this important conference. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging my colleague and thanking him for this opportunity to bring together two uh, very important disciplines. Uh, most of you, I think, are here because of your interest in digital innovation and digital transformation of your companies. And um, I'm here representing the sort of discipline of change management. How do we lead people through organization-wide change? And um, Young Jin and I both believe that, that these two things uh, need to be married in order for the ideas and the expertise and the science that you've all been learning about in this conference, for that to really come to fruition. So some of the key things I want to talk through, uh, this idea that digital transformation calls for uh, a set of abilities in our leadership to bring about effective large system change. Along with this, however, is a little bit of a, of a conundrum or a paradox in terms of our current legacy ideas about how to bring about change, how to transform large systems. Um, were built, discovered, uh, created in times that were very, very different from the current environments that we face. And so we have a challenge in terms of where and how can we bring new ideas about bringing change about in our organizations. So uh, the, the big new idea I want to talk to you about this morning is how do we leverage strengths? What are they? How do we leverage them in order to bring about effective or what we call positive change? And that leads me to uh, introducing you to a new uh, theory and method of change leadership called appreciative inquiry. Uh, this method was created here by myself and my colleagues at Case Western Reserve University. It's proven to be a very, very effective way to transform large, complex systems. So let me begin with a myth. Uh, there's several of these I want to sort of unpack this morning with you. So the first myth uh, that I think we all uh, can identify with, at least, is this idea that we naturally resist change. So if we think of um, implementing a new digital strategy, or if we think of digital transformation or the future workplace and how do we transform to the future workplace, um, most of us immediately sort of assume that people are going to resist change. They're going to disagree or they're going to have different opinions about the ideas and they're not going to want to go along. The reality is people don't resist change. We change all the time. We adapt, we're constantly changing. What we resist is the experience of being changed 
Adults do not respond well when they feel like they're being forced or pushed to change. So I want to unpack this a little bit and um, uh, sort of understand where this came from. Uh, borrowing from some of the work of my colleague uh, Ralph Stacy and his work on complexity theory, if you just look at our world today, our environment, and just uh, simplify it for a moment, look, take, take two dimensions. So on the lower dimension here, the, uh, the presence of clarity and certainty or the degree of uncertainty. How predictable is the future? And then in the vertical axis, the likelihood of agreement that uh, the, the key leadership or the key critical mass of people who are making decisions are likely to agree on the, the general direction to take. So you have high agreement, and then you have high likelihood of disagreement or diversity of views. So in this lower right, where it's clear we can predict with some certainty into the future, and we're more likely to get agreement on general de or basic decisions, which way to go and so forth. This is where all of our popular change theories come from. They come from studies of organizations that existed in this kind of an environment. So uh, from the beginning of the industrial age through the middle of the last century, probably up until the 1970s, maybe early 80s, before we had the uh, globalization and we had the impact of information technology, that's where our theories of change actually came from, okay? You could do a five-year strategic plan. You actually could predict with fairly good certainty your market conditions uh, for the next five to eight quarters, uh, obviously, things have changed. The half-life of uh, technical innovations uh, alone means today we can't predict much more beyond a quarter, maybe two quarters. Um, so what happened is that in this kind of an environment, high certainty, high likelihood of predicting the future, high likelihood of agreement on, ma on major decisions, you, you naturally could create order. You could create predictability inside your organizations. And so the top-down direction, giving feedback, correcting errors, what we call traditional command and control that came from studies of bureaucracy, uh, leveraging urgency, you know, letting people know there was a, a big problem and that if they didn't do something, jobs would be threatened and so on. Those things worked. Those kinds of approaches actually were effective and, 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 and efficient, okay? Now today, we exist in a very different environment. High degrees of uncertainty, uh, whether it's due to these uh, decreasing half-lives of technical innovation or things like a pandemic, and much more diverse opinions and perspectives that have been brought into the organization intentionally means that making decisions and gaining agreement is more difficult. So the world is much more complex, much more turbulent, if you want to call it that, in terms of the environment that your organizations exist in or are trying to function in. So we hear words like complexity, Ambiguity, volatile change, fast pace, diversity, agility. These are sort of the new adjectives for what an effective, uh, responsive, adaptive, competitive company needs to be. Very different from that lower left uh, part of that diagram. So the um, dilemma we have is that when we approach the notion of change, how do we get people on board, moving, wanting, eager, involved in a change or a transformation program? The tools that we're most familiar with using and the most popular tools out there, the methods, have been derived in a, in a context 
historically that was very, very different. And in fact, those tools are failing us. Uh, there's a well-quoted uh, and um, uh, consensus growing in the literature right now that most of our intentional change efforts only succeed 25 to 30 percent of the time. Uh, the McKinsey Company uh, is often quoted as the source of this. Uh, over three different years, they uh, surveyed 6,800 senior executives, and 70% uh, uh, reported that their change efforts did not achieve the operational or organizational goals that they had set out. Um, and then you can see here where they attribute the cause. Uh, most of us always go to the budget. You know, there was never enough resources to fund it. But in fact, uh, what they're looking at as the failure comes uh, around management's approach, how they interact with employees, and the employees themselves feeling this sense of resistance. Um, the scholarly evidence for this is growing from different disciplines, so it's not just in one area. Mergers and acquisitions, total quality management, culture change, uh, re-engineering. Uh, there's been studies in all those areas that are coming to this same general finding that somewhere around 70 to 65 to 70 percent of the time, we're just not getting uh, the results that we're trying to aim for in planned or intentional change and transformation programs. So I want to come back to this diagram for a moment just to highlight the complexity or the challenge here for change leaders. Um, when we focus on managing and improving the status quo, uh, we have tools like gap analysis. We focus on procedures. We focus on uh, managing performance and projects. We focus on finance and risk management. And all these things are necessary if and when we need to organize routine, predictable, high-quality, standardized services or products. We also, all of us in our organizations represented here today, all of us are now experiencing these other things as well. Um, how, do, how do we create conditions for more innovation? How do we challenge the status quo? Um, how do we foster more connectivity? How do we uh, spread power, flatten organizations? How do we speed up decision make making? How do we become more agile? The, the point here is not either or. In fact, I think any of you could point to different parts of your current organization where it feels like we're in the lower right or it feels like we're in the upper left. We actually have to be able to go back and forth. Uh, no organization is going to exist and compete if it isn't doing some of those things in the lower left. And they're not going to compete and succeed anymore if they're not doing things in the upper right. So we have to embrace complexity and uncertainty, not try to minimize it. We need to embrace it, as well as focus where we need to on order, control, process, and so on. So what we need is more or newer or different change tools to help us say yes to the mess. There's a messiness here. There's a complexity that's not going to go away. And so uh, my uh, contribution this morning, I hope, is to share with you uh, at least one new tool to help embrace the messiness, to help uh, bring about transition and transformation in a complex, messy kind of environment. So what is this thing called appreciative inquiry? This is the, um, the change theory and method that I want to introduce you to. Um, it's short, uh, the short phrase for it is AI, so it's a different kind of AI. 
so what it is, uh, it begins with a collaborative and rigorous search to identify and understand the current strengths in the organization in order to then imagine what the future possibilities could be. And when you do it in that order, when one comes before two, you then create a, a platform for stakeholders to co-create the future. First, by designing together what are feasible, actionable ideas and how could we implement them, and then to actually carry out the implementation. It starts with strengths. It doesn't start with uh, brainstorming the future, doing a blue sky whiteboard. So I want to go to this idea of strengths and unpack that a little bit with you. We know that strengths help us to get things done. They help us to perform. Could strengths also help us to transform? There's a whole science of strengths that's been developed in the last two decades um, from the Gallup organization. Uh, the the uh, Strength Finder is an example of a tool that's out there to help people uh, discuss, focus, pay attention to and develop their strengths and to merge their strengths or meld them with other people's strengths. This strengths idea um, was highlighted by none other than Peter Drucker, uh, the most um, published and quoted thinker on management and leadership in the last century. We wanted to share with him the work we were doing with this thing called appreciative inquiry. Um, and he was about to publish not his last book at the age of 94, but his second to last book called The New Society. And uh, when we were explaining uh, how we were trying to leverage strengths as a change method, um, we, we had a question set up in our interview uh, that you would appreciate if you were talking to somebody that you held in high esteem. And we asked him, we said, Peter, you know, given this lifetime of thought leadership, this lifetime of contribution to the science of the art and the science of leading and managing, uh, if you could leave just one message for future generations, what would that message be? And he must have been asked that question before because he, doesn't, he didn't hesitate in the transcript. He said, well, that's easy. And then this was his quote that the task of leadership is to align our strengths such that the system's weaknesses become irrelevant. Now, if you're hearing that for the first time, it probably sounds like a nice, clever juxtaposition of strength and weakness. Um, maybe the voice inside is saying, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, to us, it was very supporting of what we were doing and the work we were developing, but it was also very provocative. Uh, take off your management or your organization hat for a moment, put on your parental hat. Um, the first time our child or children bring home a C or, God forbid, a D on that, re on that report card, what do we do? You know, there are several grades on there, but there's that C or that D. And I don't know about you, but if I'm honest, I immediately, you know, what the heck is happening in that class? What's going on? Why, you know, um, I focus on the weakness. My notion of development, my notion of growth is tied to eliminating or neutralizing weakness. And in fact, we think that's something that our whole society has been socialized to or socialized into. We, we know about strengths, but we tend to take them for granted. If we're shown some strengths and shown some weaknesses, it's almost automatically we're going to be drawn to the weaknesses. How do we get rid of them? How do we strategize against them? And so on. Now, I'm not here pretending that that's wrong or that we don't need to pay attention to weakness. And I don't even think Peter Drucker was saying that. But what he was highlighting is, what about those strengths? How can those strengths become uh, positive forces 
for growth, not just for getting things done, but for actual growth and development. So let me unpack it one step further. When you leverage strengths, so when you have an uh, intentional conversation about what is working best and who's doing things that's helping to make things succeed, uh, or you're using the tools that are out there to codify and create language around my strengths and your strengths, when you spend time doing that in conversation, in dialogue with a team or a work group or a mentor and a mentee, Three things happen simultaneously, not, not in any order, but three things happen. You get an uplift in positive affect. Uh, people in that conversation immediately experience a higher level of positivity. They become more highly engaged, and they see new future possibilities. This is key. When people are engaged, feeling positive in the moment, they see new possibilities. They see the future differently. These three things um, are like an alchemy. When they, when they happen together, they are the conditions or they create the conditions for what we call generative connections. And we've been able to show in research they can lead to higher productivity better well-being, more learning, more cooperative capacity or more ability to collaborate across boundaries, across functions, across differences, and higher resilience, personally, team, organizationally, communally. And we've found this at multiple levels, in the workplace, in one-on-one -on -one coaching, in teams, families, and communities, supply chains. Um, it's, it's a scalable uh, idea uh, that you can rely on. And so the, the appreciative inquiry method is based on this dynamic. If we can create in a group of stakeholders these three conditions, the engagement, the emotions, and seeing the new possibilities or bolder, broader possibilities, we can actually build cooperative capacity. We can get people to um, not just go along with change, but to own it, to, to actually behave like owners, to co-design and really want to implement change ideas that they have built together. So let me talk about each three for just a, a few moments. The positive affect, the engagement, and then seeing the future possibilities. Um, for the last uh, no, almost two decades now, there's been uh, the emergence of a subfield in psychology called uh, the domain of positive psychology. One of the um, thought leaders here is Barbara Fredrickson, and what they've demonstrated is that the more frequently we experience positive emotion, which of course is temporal, it's gonna come and go, but the more frequently we experience it, uh, it changes how the mind works, it builds resources, it has uh, what we call an undoing effect on stress that we've been holding on to. It builds resilience, it's healthier. Um, it can be cultivated, it can be learned. It's not something that's just inherently, you have it or you don't have it. It's not like optimism and pessimism. Um, the, the, the summation of this is what Barbara calls broaden and build theory, that the more frequently we experience positivity, we broaden our um, repertoire of what we think of as alternatives when we face a situation. We, we broaden our search for response, as opposed to when we're tense, stressed, um, we, we, we can't see alternatives, hardly at all. We cope. We, we just manage our way through the moment. So uh, the more we experience positivity, the more we broaden our perspective, okay? And we build a resilience or even a resistance to held on negative affect. 
So, um, you know, lots of things bother us, and we, and we tend to hold on to them, or we tend to stomach them, or we say, okay, I'll just, you know, move on and let that go, but we don't really let it go. And uh, what they have found in their research is, is that, again, the more we experience positivity, it's one way of releasing that held on to negativity, and it prevents um, people from uh, getting their buttons pushed or just having all of a sudden an outburst of uh, negativity or hostility. The, the point here is not that we should all make people feel good all the time or we should just be happy and friendly all the time. The point is that the more we experience positive affect in the sort of normal conditions of work and organizations, the more likely we are to be able to see broadly, more broadly, options, alternatives, opportunities. That's the key point. If, if I want to get a team or a project group to really own a, a future change idea, uh, I need them to be able to honestly uh, see those ideas, see those possibilities. Um, so again, establishing positivity is, a, is one ingredient of what we call these generative connections. Now let me talk about engagement. So, so one of the other two of the second of the three things that happen when we leverage strengths is people's engagement is uplifted. Again, temporary. This isn't permanent. It's temporal, but um, that's the dynamic we need to create. I'll get back to that um, in a little bit later. So these are just uh, uh, data from different studies about either the difference between companies with highly engaged people versus highly disengaged or individuals who report high engagement versus high disengagement. So highly engaged employees, more committed to helping their company succeed, more likely to recommend improvements, more likely to recommend improvements, more inclined to innovate, more likely to recommend their company as their employer, less likely to be absent from work. Another study, higher profitability, higher productivity, higher customer engagement, lower absenteeism, lower shrinkage, lower safety incidents. Another um, study in The Economist, 84% uh, of senior leaders globally say that disengaged employees is one of the top three challenges or threats facing their company's future. This uh, chart here from Gallup uh, indicates uh, that in the middle, you've got 28 to 30 percent people globally reporting that they're highly engaged in their work. You've got 18 to 20 percent globally reporting that they're highly disengaged, they're disconnected, they don't care, etc. And you've got the rest in the middle, uh, somewhat engaged, uh, but not really inspired, not disengaged, but sometimes uh, very, very uh, neutral or bland about their work and their uh, role in the company. These, these uh, findings have not shifted in the last decade. Uh, we're, we're roughly around a quarter highly engaged, a quarter or slightly less highly disengaged, and the rest in the middle. The, the theory or, the, or the, the recommendations are that if you can move the middle, not really work so hard on that 18 to 20 percent, but if you can move the middle, move that needle, then you have a, a real value add for your organization. Um, the estimated loss to the U.S. economy alone uh, this is a 19, or sorry, this is a 2016 estimate, so it's probably even more today. 450 to 550 billion dollars lost, or an opportunity if we could move the middle into the highly engaged. So the connection back to strengths is that. Um, when we leverage strengths, when we focus people on their strengths, 
That's one way, not, not the only way, but one way of increasing engagement. Okay, the third thing that happens when we focus on strengths, remember we had uh, higher um, positive affect, we had higher engagement. Now the other one was to see the future differently, see new possibilities. The, I think we all would agree from our experience, if, if I asked you to identify an effective change that you've been a part of, one of the ingredients would be everybody coalesced or everybody aligned or everybody committed to or everybody was intrinsically excited about a common goal, a common future image. It's, it's one necessary ingredient for any effective change at any level. So uh, this idea of we need to see the future differently in order to transform. Uh, we don't just do things because of past problems. We don't just uh, correct. We actually need to uh, identify, be um, intrinsically connected to a positive future image. Um, this is just a quote from the artist Degas. Um, I had the opportunity before the pandemic to be in the uh, Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and there was a, an exhibit uh, on Degas. And amidst all this great art, they had put different quotes up on the walls, and this one just jumped out at me. Uh, about um, our images of the future. In the work we're doing, what we find is that people behave similarly to plants uh, where we have the notion of heliotropism, uh, this, this uh, idea that uh, the explanation, the scientific explanation for why plants will grow around obstacles to where the sun is shining most of the time, uh, why flowers open up in the daytime. Um, you know, th we, things will go through concrete and blacktop and uh, things like that to, to be where the sun shines. We find the same characteristic in people, that the more positive the future image that we can create and find, the more positive that image is to them, the more likely they are to find ways to get there, uh, that, that they will uh, work hard to overcome uh, barriers. Uh, they won't just sort of say, well, there's no funding for that, forget about it. They'll, they'll find ways uh, to make, even if it's small steps, to try to get toward that positive image. Uh, we know this in medical research, People with more positive self-talk before surgery come out of surgery better. Uh, we know it in teams, um, studies of teams. We know it in athletics. Uh, the more positive the image of the performance is and the more you rehearse to that image, the better you perform. So uh, the, the importance of seeing future possibilities back connected to strengths. So if, um, if this is true, if we can bring people together, focus on strengths, strengths create those three conditions, uh, positive affect, high engagement, and uh, seeing new possibilities, then that leads to conversations and dialogues that can generate new ideas, and then people are committed to wanting to make those ideas happen. Now this, this bucks up against another myth, right? Uh, we cannot teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, therefore, something like digital transformation will require letting go of the past. These stakeholders, these people that we imagine are part of a change or they're necessary to bring about an effective change they're not really going to want to change. And because they've been used to what they're doing, um, we can't actually get them to transform their thinking or their behavior. So that's the myth. The reality is, is that legacy systems, 
organizations that have been around at least for a while all have strengths and they need to transform digitally and they need to have a digital strategy and they need it's not either or we don't have to start from scratch uh, we, we don't have to have a greenfield um, organization we can take the old tried and true successful up to certain points organizations and transform them Every organization that's represented by you all in this conference has strengths. Even if you feel like you're struggling with innovation, even if you feel like you're struggling with this digital transformation idea, you have strengths. And the key thing here is that people are most engaged and will change best when they are connected to those strengths. So the, the, the old idea is, well, particularly uh, the older generations, they're stuck in their ways. Uh, we can't teach them new tricks. We're going to have to replace them. We're going to have to ease them out. We're going to have to redesign work that they can't actually fit in. So they, so they see why they need to um, be removed or something like that. Uh, we, we find just the opposite. If you can find the strengths that are operating that relate to innovation, change, good adaptation, uh, timely execution of projects, etc., you find those strengths, people connect to them, and they're more likely to go along with change. Not just go along, in fact, they're more likely to invest in the change. So I want to show you three clips of organizations that are all legacy organizations. They have been around, they've been established, and they are leveraging their strengths to transform. I want everybody to capture and grasp every skill that, and that's what part of the, the Leadership Summit is about, to help leaders develop the skills that they need so that they can fulfill this calling that we've laid out for them. That we are going to hold them accountable for the growth and the development of the people that have been entrusted to them. Uh, so I believe in AI to the end. Uh, one of the things that's becoming clear to me is that this work can't stop here today. That there has been too much invested uh, by you personally and by our institution in this. There are things we need to continue to pursue. This is one of those. The more people that gets involved in this, like we go back, we tell people on the ship and everything like that, they get more involved, they want to know about it. I mean, there was people fighting to come here. There was people fighting to come. You know, what? I want to come, I want to come. You know, you know so many people. And um, I was just glad I was picked before, so I knew I had an invite. I was invited to come this time. You know, was, I, I could I mean, I could have paid somebody to take my spot. I mean, somebody could have paid me to take my spot because they, you know, that's how bad they wanted to come. What will you remember most about this week? Through the appreciative inquiry process, we're able to dream and imagine what we envision our company being in the future and uh, laying the foundation to make it so. The fact that everybody's involved shows that everybody cares and a lot of our ideas as me as a dock worker may help the switcher, which in turn may help the sales clerk. Um, it, I think we can all help each other. We need 100% involvement. We need for everybody that has been here at the AI Summit, we need for everybody to go and spread the word. Each one of us has somebody that looks up and respects you at your job. Each one of us. If you get one guy with you to follow you, he got somebody else. And he got somebody else. When you find that one brother or sister that is down, what you do? You pick him up and you take him with you because we're not leaving no one behind. Nobody behind. We're going to continue to do this thing.
When we decided to put this appreciative inquiry together, we wanted to gather the very best of the best of Parker. All change begins in the imagination and mind, the collective mind, the way we think about the future. words that we use about the future, the stories we tell ourselves about Parker in the future, common ground images and visions that we have, the so hopes and dreams that we have for Parker in the future. We have planted one billion trees now worldwide. We got zero waste in every building. Everything is totally recycled. We're now working as self-managed work groups. And first of all, there was a heck of a lot of passion on this team and on all of our discussions. And the ideas were flying. Um, you know, we came up with 131 ideas. How, how might we be known as a company providing solutions benefiting mankind? At Parker, we will make sure that our children have fresh air, blue skies, green grass, and pure water. How might we as an organization have a community including leaders and employees that represent our global community. The Empowerment Summit to me has been the most eye-opening experience of my lifetime with Parker Hannafin. Parker Hannafin to me was local and coming to this summit I realized that we are really global and that we share the same thoughts and feelings and needs tremendous knowledge, capability, and excitement. Tomorrow I return to Brazil better than when I arrived. I feel empowerful. So before I uh, show you what each of those three episodes had in common, uh, just let me highlight each one for a moment. Uh, hopefully you, you saw the engagement, you saw the positive affect, you saw the future imagery. Uh, those three conditions, you, you saw them on display. Uh, the first one, the Navy, they were working on retention, uh, how to improve the uh, number of volunteers who re-up after their first 18-month um, posting is complete. Uh, they reported to Congress two years after that summit a $2 billion savings in unnecessary training costs uh, due to higher retention. In the uh, Roadway Express case, uh, they used the appreciative inquiry over a five-year period. They tripled their share price during a recession. They became a darling of um, uh, the industry publications. They also became a high takeover target for Yellow Corporation, who was the market leader at the time. And in the uh, Parker uh, case, they are well on their way to, uh, they've joined the UN Global Compact. Uh, they're well on their way to uh, becoming a sustainable uh, company uh, in terms of uh, not just profitability, but corporate social responsibility. What, what did they all have in common? What, what was this AI process they were using? So they had all gathered an important uh, group of stakeholders, uh, people that represented the whole system. So in Winston-Salem at that Roadway Express site, uh, I believe that's a site of about 1,400 employees. You had about uh, 200 in the room, I believe, roughly, and um, they represented dock workers, short haul drivers, long haul drivers, mechanics, sales, um, uh, uh, forklift operators, represent and shifts. So they represented all the different parts of the whole system. Um, we bring that kind of a stakeholder group together. We have a focus topic, a strategic issue that we want to transform, improve, change, innovate around. That's what uh, dictates who should be in the room. And then the first thing they do is they discover the current strengths or best practices that are helping them be at their best so far related to the topic. So in the Navy case, in terms of retention, 
that was framed as how do we create bold and uh, bold and engaged leaders at every level of our organization. So the discovery was about, okay, when we're doing that now, even if it's just a little bit, how are we doing it? What are the success factors? Who's doing what? How is the organization helping that to happen? So you discover the shared strengths that already operate or have operated up to now related to your focal issue or topic. Now, somebody may say, well, what if there aren't any strengths? Um, there are. There are always strengths. There are always times where we've done a better job at something than we made a mistake or whatever. They may be rare. They may not be nearly as frequent as when we make mistakes, but we all have moments where there's success, and what we want to do is highlight those, shine the light on them, and then look for the underlying success factors. So we call that discovery, appreciating what is already helping us to innovate, organize, deliver customer service, make fast product development cycles, whatever our topic might be. So the outcome of that set of conversations is what we call the positive core, the shared strengths or best practices that are already in our capacity. Again, we may want to do them much more often. We may want to do them quicker, but they're already here. Why don't, we don't have to do benchmarking to find them. We don't have to fantasize. We know that they're actually possible. Now, this sets the stage for the second phase, which is called dream. This is where we do talk about the future. What could be? What would we wish it to be? Please note the discovery before the dream. This, this is one thing that is different from the typical change models out there, which start with urgency and then immediately go to vision. Uh, here's the problem, folks. Here's why you got to change. Now, let's talk about what the future goal is. What we want to do here is we want to set a different stage for people to talk about the future. We want them to be in that highly engaged, highly positive mode so that they see future possibilities differently. And we've actually shown in our research, you can take the same group of people take them in a room, give them a whiteboard task about future scenarios. What are all the ideas about what we want to be two years from now or something like that? If you take that same group and you first have them revisit strengths, when we've been successful, why were we successful, who did what, what were the factors, and then you put them through that future exercise, they generate about two and a half times as many ideas, and much of those are much bolder. They're like BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious stretch goals. So people, the same person, sees the future differently based on the kind of questions we give them and the, and the state that they're in. So the dream conversation is about that future, the possibilities, um, we um, have groups of stakeholders, subgroups, uh, imagining their ideal future, presenting it to others. And then there's some voting and mapping on actionable ideas. Uh, they don't actually choose a dream or a ideal state. They share a whole bunch of ideal images, and then they generate actionable ideas to get to the images that they're most attracted to. They vote on those ideas so that in a group of, say, uh, in any of those groups that you saw on the little clips, you might get um, 30 to 40 actionable ideas. But once you vote on them and everybody votes, you give everybody five dots or something like that, you, you narrow them down to five, seven, maybe at most 12 uh, actionable ideas. And so then the design phase, people choose which of those highly voted on ideas they want to help make happen. 
And so in the design phase, you actually self-form into new stakeholder groups to um, create aspiration statements for your specific change idea, what will success look like, to brainstorm and design prototypes and action plans for how to get there. Design thinking, design tools, all get uh, accessed in, in that phase. And then these new teams are now the deployment teams. And so the destiny phase is beyond these meetings and these discussions. Now each of these teams is self-managing their change project or their initiative. And so they're learning and improvising as they go on. Now, the, the thing I want to reemphasize, which you saw a few people comment on in the short clips, who's doing this? This isn't just them, the employees, or them, the uh, innovation project team, or them, a certain part of the organization. This is representatives of the whole system that are relevant to your topic. And leadership is in these conversations side by side, elbow to elbow with everyone else. There's no making recommendations by one group and then giving them to a decision making group. The so-called decision makers are mixed in with everybody else co-creating, co-discovering, co-dreaming, co-designing, and co-implementing. The more we worked with this process, appreciative inquiry, and the more it has spread, there's an there's a international global community of practice at our most recent global conference. I think we had 42 countries represented, over 600 uh, participants. The, uh, what, what we keep running up against is that this strength-based approach highlights uh, it you, you immediately feel the tension in yourselves as well as in teams and groups with what we call the deficit theory of change or the deficit approach to change and this isn't just at work this isn't just in organizations gallup has done uh, their research and this was their quote that most schools companies and families function on an unwritten rule Let's fix what's wrong and let the strengths take care of themselves. The opposite of Peter Drucker's idea that we had earlier on. So that's led us to this notion of positive change. Now, people would say, well, isn't all change positive? Or in the field of organization development, where you apply behavioral sciences to help organizations change, isn't all that positive? Well, if it succeeds, it certainly is positive. But what we mean by positive change is focusing on what we call the positive deviance from the norm, not focusing on the deficit deviance. So deficit deviance is error reduction, gap reduction. Uh, all of our popular tools in the last uh, two or three decades, uh, Six Sigma, Nine Sigma, lean manufacturing, statistical process control, they're all useful tools for narrowing or reducing deficit deviance. They're actually not developmental tools. They're not transformational tools. In those systems, you set a target. You don't change it. Then you create measures, you give feedback, and this is called continuous improvement. Really, continuous improvement would be this, then this, then this. But that's not part of those practices, nor should it be. Those practices are intended for um, predictable, routine, procedural activity that has to be performed at a standard, that has to be done efficiently for competitive advantage. But it's deficit deviance. It's trying to get from the negative to zero where zero is the norm. What about when we exceed the norm? What about when we are excellent? We're not just okay, we're great. What can we learn from that? There's been a whole new field called positive organization scholarship uh, originated out of the University of Michigan. And what they talk about is abundance 
deviants. Their interest is studying when we're great, why? Not when we're bad, how do we get better? Okay. Uh, again, it's not either or. We need uh, those tools appropriately applied to get from the negative deviant back to norm. But what about going from the norm to excellent? What about innovation? That's in the abundance deviance arena. And that's what we're calling positive change. We're interested in studying when do organizations thrive? When are they sustainably prosperous and giving back to the giving value to society? When are employees highly engaged, not just satisfied and okay with their work? The same thing went on in psychology, which I mentioned earlier, the positive psychology movement. They didn't change any of their research methods. They simply changed their questions. So instead of one more study about what's the influence of stress or anxiety on creativity or productivity, they decided to study, well, what's the influence of hope or joy on creativity and productivity? I've mentioned language here a couple of times. I just want to touch on this quickly. Uh, there have been studies of the unintended consequences of deficit discourse. If we do spend most of our day talking about problems, causes, errors, gaps, uh, all with the best intention of wanting to do the right thing, wanting to solve it so that uh, there's improvement. Even then, if, you, if you're in that kind of dialogue day in and day out, there are consequences. These are not the consequences of a leader style or of an intention. In fact, in most cases, they're unintended, but they do show up. People just get tired. People get exhausted from problem after problem after problem, even if some of them are getting solved and we're succeeding. Because it's like, well, what's the next problem coming at me? Um, there are spirals of deficit vocabularies. The more we use them, the more we use them. Uh, and the more we invent words. Uh, in medicine, uh, we have diagnostic code manuals that have grown exponentially over the editions that have been published. Um, that's language about what can be wrong with people. It's very important language, don't get me wrong. It's absolutely necessary for that science to exist. But the fact that it grows exponentially in terms of the number of codes that come out, new codes that come out in the new editions, it signals something about our, our society, our, our way of, of being. Um, the evidence of any increase in vocabulary about what could be good about us, it's harder to uh, quantify, but nobody thinks it's exponential. Uh, we, we have words like wellness. We have words that are relatively new, but um, it's not growing like the growth in the negative or deficit vocabulary. When we do str uh, SWOT analyses, I assume most of you are familiar with that. It's just a tool for uh, doing an environmental scan. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Very balanced. You have strengths and opportunities. You have weaknesses and threats. The, the problem comes is that when teams do this, when they use the tool, they all do a great data dump. They all have energy in filling out all four areas. But then there's like a, somebody behind a screen turns on a magnet. And when it comes to, okay, what do we do with this information? Everybody wants to go to what? the weaknesses and the threats. It's like it's written into our job description, at least in our heads. Our job is to prevent weakness or get rid of them and strategize against threats so that they don't hurt us. Um, what about the strengths and the opportunities? Again, it's not about ignoring the weaknesses and the threats, but what about the strengths and opportunities? And our, our experience using appreciative inquiry is that all of us, myself included, if I really look at my choices and what I think of first when I'm in a new situation, I tend to go to what's wrong, uh, what didn't I like, 
and what can I criticize in order to make things better? So we, we need to develop our muscles, <laughs> uh, which, which means certain skills and practice in also giving the strengths and the opportunities their, their share of attention and focus. So all of this that I'm talking about with appreciative inquiry is a shift. It's a shift in mindset. It's a shift in language. It's a shift in the way we look at things. Um, you're all familiar with this quote, uh, or you've seen one close to it, uh, attributed to Einstein. No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. We must learn to see the world anew. With appreciative inquiry, we, we think that it, it's much like that. We're helping people see their world in a new way that is still real to them. We're not pretending about strengths. We're not fantasizing about success factors. We're helping people to actually study and understand real success factors when they have been successful. Um, so it's, it's real for them. Uh, it's their world, but it's a different look. It's starting with different questions, which leads to different insights. So up again, we're up to another myth that I want to highlight. Um, if this shift of mindset is important, then um, it, it challenges another myth. And that myth is if we study what's wrong, we're going to get good. And, or if we study what's wrong, we're going to get better. Okay, it, it's kind of built in. The reality is, if you study bad, the best you're going to get is not bad. You're going to get the absence of bad. Now, in some cases, that may be what's absolutely necessary. If I have a disease or if I have um, very troubling symptoms, I need to get those symptoms taken care of uh, before I can think of other kinds of healing or other kinds of wellness. There are, there are cert certain situations where just getting not bad is okay. It is what we should be doing, but not for digital transformation, not for innovation. The reality is if you want to be the best or better or excellent or world-class or number one in your market or a industry leader, then that's what you have to study. You have to study when excellence has occurred, when best has occurred, when industry leadership has occurred. You, we go in the direction of what we study. So it's choiceful. Again, I'm back to this choice. It's not uh, that sometimes we are in problems. We are. But we choose where we are going to go. Our questions are fateful. This is a, a huge um, foundation idea behind the strength-based or the uh, appreciative inquiry approach. Um, if I want to learn about an organization, they want to give me their chart, their strategic plan, um, uh, maybe the last quarterly uh, progress report on the plan. Actually, I'm going to learn a lot more if I listen. What are the questions they're asking? What are they looking at in the staff meetings? What are they talking about in the informal spaces? We're going to be moving in the direction of what people are asking questions about, not the direction of the plan. I'm sad to say plans have very little value until and unless they're brought into conversations. If I start my staff meeting with a spreadsheet and I've you know, yellowed in the cells where we're behind schedule or over budget, then the budget, the schedule, the priorities make a difference. But just having a plan doesn't influence anybody's efforts uh, any hour of the day. It has to be brought into the questions and the conversations that we're having. You can ask any question in any situation. In recessions, there's always organizations who hunker down, manage cost, get as lean as they can, and just try to get through it. They cope. 
when they come out of the recession, which we always do, they look around and there's at least one other organization in their business, one other competitor who's now a leap ahead because they dared to ask questions about innovation, about excellence, about new customers, about new business during a recession. The, the, the typical mindset is, well, we, we, the conditions are such that you just can't talk about that right now. That's for later. What we're saying is you can ask any question in any situation. It's your choice. The system isn't making it one way or the other. I can go into any organization represented in this conference, with, honestly, with all due respect, and if I want to write a case study on organization sabotage, I can. I'll find it. You can come into our university, and if you want to write a article on plagiarism, which is the worst thing we can think of in an academic environment, you can. We find, we learn about what we're asking about. We go in the direction of the question. So let's turn it around. I can go into any of your organizations and I can write a case study on extraordinary self-directed teamwork, even if you don't use that language. All I have to do is ask people for stories of times when they saw some issue that needed attention, they got together with one other person or more, and they took care of it without it being part of their job. That's self-directed teamwork, and everybody in every organization has one of those stories. We have strengths. We have success factors. We just don't spend too much time actually using them and learning from them. So what are the implications for digital transformation from all this? Here are a couple that seem important to me. If you are um, on an innovation pathway, or if you're trying to change your culture to be more innovative, or if you're trying to apply uh, digital technology and digital innovations to shift the, the, the whole nature of your workplace, engage with the whole system. Use the stakeholder approach. Don't just start it with a small project group. Try to bring as many stakeholder representatives, people with knowledge, skills, or people who are going to be influenced by the likely innovation or the likely direction of the innovation, inside and outside the organization. Try to create a representation of the whole as early as possible so that from the very beginning, we're co-designing, we're co-dreaming, we're co-creating. Reconnect people with their strengths first. Find the shared uh, success factors from people's experiences, their real life experiences. Surface them. Let everybody see them so that there is this bump in positivity, a bump in engagement, and they will naturally then see the future possibilities differently. Then, and only then, generate ideal future images. Do the blue sky or do the um, future visioning exercise and ask people what could be and let them dream. Uh, you've primed the pump. If they're connected to strengths and they see shared strengths, they think of the whole as more, um, with more efficacy. It's like, I don't just think of my department. Well, I, I, I know we can, you know, we can uh, uh, do whatever is put in front of us, but I'm not sure about the warehouse group or I'm not sure about the finance group or whatever. They start to see the we-ness. They start to see shared strengths. So they're thinking now in terms of us. What could we achieve in the future? So that then fuels the uh, dream or the ideal futuring. Once you have all those dreams out there, then generate actionable ideas, vote on them, or use some process to cull out the best of those ideas and then let people self-join or self-form action teams. 
to design the specific ways they're going to implement, to design the specific innovation or change project, and then to own the implementation. And then lastly, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but I'm going to end on it, sustain an imbalance of positivity over negativity. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, the, the myth, this is the last myth that I wanted to unpack, uh, we change best when we're most broken, dissatisfied, or despairing. In other words, that old metaphor, when the heat is so hot on the burning platform out in the ocean, you'll finally jump. Um, I never understood this choice of two wrongs or the choice of two negatives being such an effective metaphor. But we've used that in change a lot, okay? We've got to generate urgency. We have to show people how bad things are so that we get their attention and they're open to new ideas. Um, so when we're most broken, most dissatisfied, most despairing, that's when we can get their attention and give them new ideas, uh, get them to change. The reality, we change best when we're strongest. We change, change, effective change requires lots of positive resourcing. Power to do something, not power over somebody to do something. But the key here is we don't wait or just look for opportunities when things are drastic, when things are so threatening. We change when people feel the strongest. So again, even, even if we are talking about, like today, uh, with our external conditions that do pose lots of threat, the starting point for change is not to just dive into that threat and say, you know, jobs are at stake, et cetera, et cetera. The point is to dive into when have we been successful dealing with threat? When have we been successful uh, in hard times? and using those strengths to motivate images about the future and then participation in change. So the last idea I wanted to uh, bring is this notion of positivity and negativity or positive emotional arousal and negative emotional arousal. They're both natural. We're going to experience both of them in any period of any day of our lives. So this is not about ignoring or pretending that one exists and the other doesn't exist. What it's about is looking at the relativeness of experience of deficit, despair, uh, discouragement, problem, etc., or the experience of hope, elevation, excitement, engagement, enthusiasm. We need an imbalance of the positive emotional attractors over the negative emotional attractors for change to occur effectively, for transformation to occur. So we talk about it uh, in our language, the experience of elevation comes from whole power, willpower, and way power. Whole power is what you get in the discovery conversations, that first phase. You, you get reconnected with strengths. You may discover some new strengths. You start to feel there's more we could do. So you feel a power of the whole. Willpower comes from the dream. Imagining the future and seeing you and your colleagues get excited about a future image. You, you start to, that, that positive image pulls the heliotropic idea that we talked about pulls positive behavior. It attracts it. So the willpower comes there. And then the way power comes from design. Designing different scenarios, different ways of getting to these uh, positive future images. When this ratio is around four to one or greater, we see uh, value creation. We see evidence of sustained change we see evidence of, or, or we actually see a predictor of organization success. Um, uh, again, we, we've studied uh, patients going into open heart surgery, 
uh, uh, we've studied athletes, we've studied um, organizations, sales teams, and so on. We, we get ratios as high as 6 to 1, 2 to 1, 5 to 1, never 1 to 1. It's interesting. Uh, you know, the, the, the cup is half full and half empty. If that's our view, if that's our sort of general attitude about life, the research shows it's not productive, it's not sustainable, it's not contributing to well-being. It has to be imbalanced in favor of the positive uh, affect. So the, um, the idea here is um, we have the appreciative inquiry with the discovery, dream, design, and deployment phases in all those conversations, in all the dialogues that go on in those phases, what we're trying to do is to keep an imbalance. We're not, we're not trying to uh, silence somebody who's feeling or has a negative idea or wants to critique or wants to differ. Uh, we're simply trying to keep an imbalance so that people are still open to this future possibility idea. So where can you begin? We see the core of organizing and therefore the core of changing or transforming as in conversations. And so the, the basic place to start is what's a new question you can bring that will move your next conversation with whomever it is in the direction you most want to go? Start with a new question. So here's two suggestions to practice, okay? Tonight at the dinner table, instead of whomever it's with, spouse, family, kids, uh, just a friend, just a colleague, whoever it's with, uh, instead of just saying, well, how did your day go? Or how are you doing? Be specific and intentional. What was the best moment of your day? What was the highlight of your day? Uh, what was the most exciting part of the day? Intentionally affirming, intentionally assuming that there was something strong, something positive in the day. And just see what happens. See what happens with the energy, with the exchange at the, at the table. At the workplace, your next meeting, tomorrow or next week, you're all going to run a meeting um, or be responsible for a meeting. Sacrifice just the first five minutes of your agenda and quickly go around the Zoom screen or if you happen to be physically at a table and ask each person to share a one-minute story or a one-minute answer. What was the most positive thing you saw at work since the last time we met? or the most humorous thing, or the most creative thing, or the most innovative thing. Just be intentionally positive about sharing a quick story. You go first. If somebody says, I don't have one, then you say, okay, we'll pass and come back. But you, you don't let them not speak. You just let them listen, and they'll, they'll come up with something. And the reason for doing this is th this isn't doing a whole appreciative inquiry. This is simply helping you to experiment with a basic idea here. The sharing of positive stories, the sharing of moments when strengths were at play, what happens? What happens to people's attention? What happens to their energy? For those of you that do check-ins and check-outs at your meetings, this is just a different way of checking in, of getting people oriented in the meeting itself, coming from wherever they've been coming. So uh, thank you for your time and for listening to this. I hope you will join in our workshop that's scheduled for this afternoon. We're going to put some of these ideas into real practice so that you can experience some of this appreciative inquiry. And we're going to help you prepare to go back to work immediately and become change agents. Uh, to take uh, the, the ideas from the conference and this appreciative inquiry process, put them together, and generate new conversations back at the workplace. Thank you.